In this episode, we're talking with Brett Evans from Atlas Wealth Management, and we're going to explore what's happening with Aussie expats now that the world has opened back up. Has the tide of returning expats turned back? And if so, where are the people heading? And what are the tax and investment implications of deciding to live and work outside of Australia? Welcome to The Elephant in the Room. This is the podcast where we love to talk about the big things in property that never usually get talked about. I'm Veronica Morgan, real estate agent, buyer's agent and buyer's agent mentor, co-host of Foxtel's Location, Location, Location Australia, author of Auction Ready and co-host of Your First Home Buyer Guide. And I'm Chris Bates, mortgage broker, recently ranked number five in Australia out of over 18,000 brokers in the annual MPA Top 100 Mortgage Broker Award. Before we get started, I need to let you know that nothing we say here can be taken as personal advice. We always recommend you engage the services of an appropriate and experienced professional. Our guest today is Brett Evans. Brett is the Managing Director for the Europe, Middle East and African region and a financial planner with Atlas Wealth Management, which is the first financial services firm in Australia to specialise in providing financial advice to Australian expats. Brett himself has been an expat on and off literally his entire life and currently lives in Dubai with his family. And we last broke with him back in episode 194 when we were still locked in our homes in the winter of 2021. And a lot has changed since then and we're well overdue for an update. Thank you so much for joining us today, Brett. Thank you, guys. It's always uh, great to be back and I can't believe it was 2021 was the last time we caught up. Just over two years ago. Oh, my God. Absolutely. I think Brian and I are thinking, what are some things that we want to want to talk about and um you know the expat movement was a huge topic back in 2021 and it's you know a few years later and um there's no one better to get on than the famous uh brett evans who's known in the advice infamous industry or famous you've got your fingers on the pulse yeah that's <laughs> it um you've got uh you know i think you've got 50 different countries aussies are in over the what what are aussies doing like what are we where are we are we moving back overseas are we are we wanting to move home like in COVID? um you know, what's the general sense you're finding? Are we, uh, yeah, we wanting to explore the world again? What's happening? Where are people moving to? Like, are we, are we moving to Dubai? Are we moving to, you know, New York? What, what are we doing? Mate, it's uh, the floodgates are opened. Pretty much, uh, was it November 2021? That's when uh, Scotty from marketing opened up the gates, and and uh, it sort of started with a trickle, and then really started to ramp up from there. And I think there's been a lot of things that have been the catalyst for expats to move overseas. One is that deferral of people who were always going to become an expat and COVID stopped that. But number two, COVID taught people a lot of things about what they really want in life and, and these things that they don't want to pass by and, and not take advantage of. So we're seeing a lot of that. And then last of all, job opportunities. Right. You know, we've got, um, especially in places like Saudi, where you've got all the giga projects. I mean, these projects have 20 billion, 50 billion, 100 billion budgets. And uh, the amount of Australians flocking into Saudi right now, um, I'm probably meeting, I'd say, three to six people a week who are moving to Saudi. And uh, when you look at projects like Neon, which is just hard to get your head around the size of that sort of thing, um, that last guess with a, with a colleague of mine, a client of ours, um, we reckon there's probably five to 600 Australians just working on that one project. You know, when it comes to other locations, Dubai is a big one as well too. And the reason for that would certainly be around their change of, they've almost embraced the remote working lifestyle and uh, the amount of Australians we're meeting who are working for Australian companies out of Dubai now has been huge. So you can now legally get a residency here so therefore complying as a non-tax resident of Australia with the ATO and still work for your employer back in Australia. And obviously there's tax implications with that in the favour, but um, in the same breath, we've also got a lot of uh, changes with respect to tax residency laws that are coming through the ATO, uh, sorry, Treasury and, and Canberra did a um, consultation paper back in September. And based on that consultation paper, that's going to frame out the non-residency tax rules, which last time were revisited back in 1936. So um, if you think about back then, we put clothes in a trunk and jumped on a steamership to become an expat. This is the, the next iteration of those, <laughs> uh, those rules. So the world has changed a lot since the uh, 1936 rules were drafted and the ATL was finding very difficult to manage when it comes to um, 
uh, enforcing those rules because people's lifestyles didn't map to very old phraseology and very old rules that were dictated back in the 1930s. Do you, do you want to explain for us in general terms um, what it means about being a tax resident? Because, and we'll get to the, the property specific you know, aspects of this, but in terms of when you're earning income, um, how does that work? Because I know it's not uniform across every single country. There's obviously these, these different um, arrangements that are in place. So, like, how could somebody work for an Australian country company in a different country versus them? What happens to them when they work for a foreign company in a foreign country? Yeah, look, good question, and, and there's a lot of confusion regarding this. So, under the current rules, you need to be a resident of somewhere. If you are a, not a tax resident of any other country, you default to being a tax resident of Australia. So, the best example of that. Uh, you know, the so-called digital nomads who are sort of traveling around the world. They haven't got a residency visa or a work visa in any particular country. They're flying in using their three to 90 day tourist visas to work on a laptop out of a cafe in Bali or wherever it might be. Those sort of people are what we call a, a resident of nowhere. So therefore the ATO deems them as a resident of tax resident of Australia. When you have residency, then it comes back to you're complying with local regulations. And then over the top of that, we have what's called the double taxation agreement, which does exist between certain countries and doesn't exist between other countries. So the way a double taxation agreement works with, say, someone in Singapore, or United States, or the UK, is both countries agree that you can't be a resident tax resident of two countries. So therefore, you are a tax resident of the country you reside in and have legal right to reside in. So if you're living in the UK, you can only ever be a UK tax resident. If you reside in a country like Hong Kong or Dubai, where there is no double taxation agreement, what that means is based on your circumstances, there is a risk. You don't tend to choose to be this, but there is a risk that you may be deemed as an Australian tax resident as well as being a foreign tax resident in that country, which relates to double taxation. So when you are coming out of Australia, if you've got an employment agreement and you've got a right to live in a certain country for a period of time to work in that country, then that is meeting what we call the resides test. So the resides test is one of the four tests that you need to qualify with to be uh, a, a resident or non-resident from a tax point of view. Resides test, simply where do you put your head at night? Where do you have a legal domicile to live and work? Then we have what's called the domicile test. Now, the domicile test is very grey and very ethereal and behavioural based. And this dates back to 1930s and that's what they're trying to stamp out now. So what this relates to is where's the centre of your universe? You know, if, if I was living in Dubai and my wife and daughters were living in Australia, then I'd be working overseas, but I wouldn't be living overseas, if that makes sense. There's a big distinction between those two. My centre of yeah. my universe is more likely back in Australia as opposed to here in Dubai. When we go through and look at scenarios, say people work in Saudi, they might be working in locations where their family can't join them. So it's very grey when it comes to that sort of scenario. So that's where today's working life becomes difficult to enforce from an ATA point of view. Third test is what we call the 183-day test, spending greater than six months out of Australia. And the last one is what we call the Commonwealth Super Test, which relates to... Um, you know, are you a government employee receiving super contributions into a Commonwealth super system, which mainly refers to military service women, women men and women, as well as uh, diplomats. So it doesn't apply to a lot of folks as well too. So from our point of view, what we really look at and focus on with clients pretty much boils down to a scenario of what do your be If someone were to look at your living situation, a total stranger, what assumptions would they come to? You know, here I've got a car, I've got a job, my daughters go to school, I've got a dog. You know, I'm very much a Dubai resident. If I was living in a service department out of a suitcase with no working visa, then I'm visiting the UAE, not working. Um, so coming back to your original question of working for an Australian employee out of, say, Dubai, what people would do is they will get a freelance visa and then invoice the Australian company for their time and their salary. But it won't be a salary, it's an invoice, it's an expense payment. So they won't be entitled to any of the fair work um, agreement 
sort of legislation, they won't be entitled to super, they won't be entitled to any sort of things. So what it really comes back to is, yeah, and, and obviously the benefit for that is you don't pay Australian tax on that income. Um, no. Working for a foreign company overseas, you have set of ties with Australia completely. So you're now working overseas, your employers overseas, if you've got family, they're overseas with you, and then you're only subject to tax that relates to being in that jurisdiction, not any foreign jurisdiction. So when you're a non-resident for tax purposes, you're essentially only eligible to pay income tax or capital gains tax on what we call Australian sourced income. So if you are still on the payroll with an Australian company or rental income is a good example. And then obviously from a capital gains tax point of view, any Australian assets. So whether that primarily be what we call taxable Australian property, house, apartment, block of land, it gets complicated, doesn't it? Because I'm just thinking, you know, a lot of people do have multiple sources of income. So I guess if you're living overseas, uh, are you able to quarantine those that should be subject to Australian tax laws and those that uh, are subject to the local tax laws? It's and, and, and one of my questions too is that with work from home and this, this, uh, you know, we talk about domestically where people can live away from capital cities and away from, and in different capital cities to to where their job is, or their their company is housed or their head office is. Um, are people taking the opportunity to do that and go overseas? You know, if they have a if they have maybe another passport or they perhaps have dual residency somewhere, are people? Uh, you mentioned the person living in Dubai who's, who's working for an Australian company. Is that actually on the rise, that sort of behaviour, that sort of more of that, you know, the WFM, um, WFH, sorry, movement? Uh, definitely. It's uh, on the rise and I can only see it getting even larger. And the gentleman I was referring to before, he's a software engineer for an Australian IT company. He doesn't need to be in the office. He's mm. on the computer. Um, he's doing his thing. It's one of those scenarios where if there's not too much of a time difference between your country of location and the company where you're working for, um, it's actually quite easy to manage. So even here in the Dubai office for Atlas, you know, we're six hours behind Dubai. You'll find that there's a bit of activity behind me, even though it's eight o'clock in the morning, we're in the office pretty early because we get six hours of polarity between the two offices, I guess you could say from a working point of view, and we tend to leave early. Now, if you look at folks who have a job where they're not required to be in work, uh, in, into actual physical office, they can be agnostic. And uh, I think people are embracing that now. And I think you may see more of this, especially with some of those fair work um, uh, rulings that have come out recently where employees are going to start mandating people to come back into the office. So people are going to start to say, well, how about I just become a contractor and I can work wherever I want in the world. And as long as I deliver the job that you need me to do, then happy days. Brett, I mean, um, with these, uh, you said the floodgates are open, you know, people are leaving Australia since Scotty from marketing sort of gave them the ability to do so. You know, they're going, it's a Saudi. Um, I, I'm assuming that I want to live in Saudi forever. Um, that's just, you know, they, they're going there for money. They're, they're cash banking. Um, you know, they're coming to Dubai or they're, they're going somewhere else. I mean, are they just basically building up a profit pool, like a cash to then go at some point, bring it back to Australia? to get into housing, you know, it's, it's almost the, the, the way to solve their problem. It's, you know, and not, and, and I'm not, obviously not everyone, there's always, you know, exceptions to the rule, but a lot of your clients are the ultimate goal is to get back to Australia. And the ultimate goal is to buy some assets and, and particularly property in Australia. Yeah. Look to me, there's sort of three silos, I guess you could say from an expat's point of view, um, two of those three have an intention to return to Australia. Uh, one of the three doesn't actually intend to return to Australia, but when you dig a bit deeper, what it actually boils down to is actually they do, but they'll be coming back to Australia in their later years because they want healthcare services and those sort of things. So Medicare and that sort of stuff. So they'll come back to Australia between the age of 65 and 75. Um, we're seeing a very fractured sort of, I guess, motivations when it comes to people coming out of the countries. Um, there's actually a lot of retirees who are leaving Australia. They've lived in Australia their whole working life, and now they're actually going out of Australia and moving to places like Asia uh, and Europe to spend their their sort of uh, golden years, so to speak, um, living in a, a great location, either to save money, which is primarily why they go to Asia, or 
there's a lot of francophiles who are you know buying up in France. Yeah. They live in France. There's whole Facebook groups developed around this, and they'll live in France for five or ten years, and then they'll yep. uh, migrate back to Australia. So to me, I've it, seen the Italian ones too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, look, there's a whole business model there. If you if you want to be that niche, you can do that. But I guess coming back to your original question, Chris, with respect to you know, do people buy property? It's very seasonal yeah. from an expat's point of view as to whether they want to buy a property or not. They're very nervous when it comes to a this FOMO. Yeah, when they see all their friends and family in Australia buying property, they're on the phone to us. But also, to as soon as we see a bit of adverse. Um, news or you know when obviously with uh chairman dan when he made those chat changes to uh victoria just recently before he departed um with res- respect to land tax reducing the thresholds down i haven't had one conversation with anyone who wants to buy property in victoria now because they can see the body language in victoria uh, is going more and more towards increasing those costs now certainly when you're overseas the biggest problem that someone in australia has to contend with is compared to the rest of the world is yields on Australian property are very, very low as it is. And when it's that low and the, and the taxes and expenses are increasing, then people start looking offshore. And what we've seen locally here in the UAE is a lot more folks are buying locally here rather than buying back in Australia because you can get 5 to 7 up to 10% yields on property here. Now, risk return, there's a high risk of buying property in Dubai. So therefore, that's why the returns are, are greater. And some of the growth returns here have been ridiculous in terms of um, both capital and income. So people are making that trade-off so now. what, what are the looking, risks? Yeah. Um, I think not a mature market. You know, uh, Veronica, as we said before, we jumped on the call. You know, when you fly through Dubai, you look out and there's a lot of sand. So there's no new blocks of land available in Bronte or Double Bay or Balmain here there's a lot of space so they can just keep developing and that's what they're doing they're going further and further out so properties in those prime locations like on the palm and that sort of stuff becoming more um sought after but what's actually happening is if you understand this market there's no real endemic population apart from the emirati population which is 11 percent of the population so the risk is that ever decides to get up and leave Whereas in Australia, no one's going to leave. They live there. That's their home. So if uh, we've got our friends across the water here, Iran is actually about 150 miles that way. Um, if something were to get frisky or uh, something escalated there, um, people would be dumping property and, and returning to their home countries. So that that's the risk. Yeah, you're right. Because you know, I was just thinking about a client last year, almost bought a house in Edgecliff in Sydney. They almost bought something in the North Shore. Uh, they're both, um, you know, doing really well financially in terms of work. They're both like, you know, doing all sorts of things. Um, but kids just not happening. They don't want them and there's just not going to happen. So they're, they're like, do we really want to live in Australia? Property's so expensive. Like, you know, I'm a long way away from everything. I want to travel the world. And, you know, the job opportunity came up in Singapore and bang, they're out of here. Right. Um, and yeah. you know, there was like, oh, they actually had a, a, an amazing apartment actually in Sydney and it done really well. They'd sold that cause they were going to use that proceeds for. And the conversation was like, do we actually even buy something here? You know, like, and you know, when you compare to what they could get, you know, tax-free investment returns, um, you know, no issues with capital gains tax, no issues with, you know, the negative gearing, you know, the low yielding property. It's like, it's a hard decision. Like it's a hard bet. Like it's, it's, it's pretty clear that maybe you shouldn't invest in Australia. Maybe you should just take your money overseas. And so do you find Brett, a lot of your Aussies that even if they do want to buy something in Australia, just because of the way the system's structured. It's even if the Australian market runs on them a bit, they can invest that money in other ways, whether it's not just saying it's property, but in, in stocks and, you know, and because of the tax-free status, it's better off just to accumulate the money and compound the money and then buy those assets if they come back. And when they come back, is that often a lot of your advice is to do that? Probably 70% of the advice. Um, the other 30% would be if they're buying property, it's for emotional reasons. Um, they either want a, a bolt hole back in Australia that if something goes bad overseas, they can get on the plane and return to their home. The other one too mm. is a preparation for repatriation. If they think they're returning to Australia in the next one to three years, yeah. 
they want to sort of get set up so they're known what's going on. And we all know what's going on with the uh, the rental markets in Australia right now. And a lot of expats are really terrified by that, not being able to land and actually get a place to live and house their families. So yeah. to me, where we're seeing things change is, and, and this also relates to these new tax rules I was referring to before, which are very prescriptive, very binary ones and zeros. It's almost like playing snakes and ladders where it comes back to a day test. So long story short, if you have been in Australia for less than 183 days, then the next question is, and the, and this next part is open for debate, and this is what we're all trying to lobby Canberra on. The question is, have you spent greater than 45 days in Australia? And if the answer is no, then you're an unequivocal non-resident for tax purposes. ATO can't even take you to the High Court and challenge it. It is written in stone. However, if you're in Australia for greater than 45 days, then we have these four, what we call these four-factor tests. And the way the four-factor tests work, uh, you only have to fail two of the four to be deemed as an Australian tax resident. The first one, everyone fails. Do you have a passport or right of abode or citizenship in Australia? Everyone's gone. So now you only need to fail one more property. The next one, uh, sorry, one more test. The next one is what we call the accommodation yeah. test. Do you own property in Australia that is untenanted? So it's vacant. You can come and go as you please. Now, if you if you own a property in Australia and you've been in Australia for greater than forty five days, now suddenly you're a tax resident. Third one, yeah, is wow. the family factor test. Do you have a husband, wife, partner, spouse in Australia that is um, living there permanently, and you're living overseas? And the last one is, and this is a catch all with everyone, economic assets test. And one of those. One of those criteria in the economic assets test is what we call taxable Australian property, which is a house, apartment, a block of land. So if you're in Australia for greater than 45 days in a financial year and you own property and you have an Australian passport, you're an Australian tax resident. What we're trying to do right now is we're trying to get Canberra to lift that up to, to 90. They had a consultation paper uh, that closed on the 23rd of September they haven't released how many submissions, but there's a lot. And I've read everyone and everyone agrees that 45 days is too little um, because there's no exclusions. If my mum's sick and I have to go back to Australia for two weeks yeah. to yeah, check on yeah. her and then come back to Australia for a holiday, bang, it's gone. So the general consensus is... Is that why you're not going back? No, not, not at all. I mean, the rules haven't come in yet. Uh, we haven't even seen a right. Spanish memorandum or, or draft legislation. Um if I was a betting man, I'd say these rules aren't going to probably come in until 1st of July, 2025. Because um, you think about it, Canberra stops sitting today. They don't resit until February. Then they only got three months before the end of financial year of sitting period. So I don't think it's going to happen. So these that, that alone has made property a lot more sensitive in terms of whether they buy or not. So like, let's say someone's just gone to Singapore, right? Just because they're taking a job. Um, at a tech company, right? And they're going there because it's what, 15% tax or 19% or something like that. Um, yep. Got 50% yep. tax. <laughs> and they just living over there, working, their wife and kids, or the husband and wife, kids are all there. They've got a house in Australia because they're going to come back at some point. And they come back to Australia for seven weeks over Christmas. Then all that income would be Australian tax rates. So this is where the double taxation agreements kick in. So those people who reside in countries that have a double taxation agreement, there's what we call the tiebreaker clause. And the tiebreaker clause says you can't be a tax resident of two countries, you're a tax resident of the country you reside in. So those folks in Singapore, UK, US, you know, any of the 30 countries that have a DTA with Australia are not safe as houses, but they're safer if you reside in a okay. country that doesn't have a DTA, Dubai, Saudi, Hong Kong, Greece, Portugal then, yeah, you would be deemed as an Australian tax resident. All overseas income and assets will be assessed from a tax point of view. And isn't that going to hit the retiree market as well, though? Because, like, you know, they, they might not want to sell their home. They, they might want to live in those countries for retirement, but they they don't want to sell all their assets, you know, right now. They want to sell them down over time. Um, that They can't come back and see their grandkids, right? Um, you know, is that going to be a real issue for certain countries around the world that Aussies just basically can't go to retired to unless they sell everything so retirees are okay and i'll tell you you know and this is a strategy we employ with our right. clients who are retirees so if their income is out of an account-based pension out of an australian super account that's tax-free so they can actually maintain their australian tax residency 
that's tax free. We were worried about us folks who are earning an income overseas. Now, there's a good strategy. Uh, you might remember last time we talked, we talked about the main residence exemption, the six year rule um, that you know yeah. was taken away from expats in um, yeah. on the first of July, 2020. One of the strategies, depending on your time overseas, as long as you return to that property, you can re-engage the main resident exemption. Now, the main resident exemption is for a six-year period. If you return to Australia in five years, you know, going back to your example before, Chris, about going to Singapore, you have a PPR in Sydney, you jump on a plane, move the family to Singapore, do five years there, have an amazing time, you come back, back into that property. Because you've returned within the six-year period, once you live in it, you re-establish your Australian tax residency. After six months, you can sell that property and it's tax-free for that whole period of time that you're away. Oh, it is. Okay. Okay. Even if you return after 10 years, then it's apportioned. So six years of the 10 or well, 60% of the gain is tax-free and 40% of the gain is taxable. So you can still re-engage it, but the importance is returning to that property. A um, bit hard when you uh, have clients who, as a couple, they left you know, sort of in their you know, 20s or early 30s, go overseas for 10, 15 years, build a brood, um, and then they, you try and tell them, you need to move back into your one-bedroom apartment in Manly uh, <laughs> with, five, with five people. And they look at you and go, you know what? I'm just going to pay the tax. <laughs> it's not worth the headaches of living in that house for, <laughs> you know, for six months. Time yeah. and place, time and place. I'm on a personal mission to help more people make better property decisions. And you can find out all about what I'm working on at veronicamorgan.com.au. And there you'll find resources for first home buyers, details about my buyer's agent mentoring program, access to suburb help for investors, or if you're looking to buy your dream home or an investment property in Sydney's inner west, eastern suburbs or lower north shore, you can connect with my team at Good Deeds Property Buyers. If you're thinking about buying your first home, upgrading to a new one or purchasing an investment property anywhere in Australia, we would love to carefully guide you through this journey and importantly, get the finance right. Please reach out via our website, wealthful.com.au. Don't forget that you can download our free full or forecaster report. Which experts can you trust to get it right? The elephant in the room dot com dot au. I mean, I remember the last time we spoke. I mean, you did you were quite scathing about the uh, government's tax treatment of expats, and it sounds like this new legislation that's on the cards sounds like that's going to get even more difficult. Yeah. Uh, so there's just no light at the end of the tunnel for that. It's, it's, I mean, I, I guess the, the thing that really alarmed me at the time was if you're planning to move overseas and you don't get advice before you go, yep. you could easily make very big decisions, very, very costly dis- decisions, um, and a lot of it depending on where you're going. So obviously the choice of whether to sell, whether not to sell, whether to plan to return within six years or not, et cetera, et cetera, uh, a lot of that is dependent on where you where you're you're going to move to and it's really hard to know exactly what you're going to be doing in say five years time particularly if you are going overseas right it's a world of opportunity so I guess that's you're embracing something different are you finding that people are shocked when you advise them or, or are most people somewhat aware no uh, it's amazing how many people call us up a month before they jump on a plane and say oh I'm moving overseas what do I need to know and yeah and you run through the laundry list of things and half an hour later their eyes are like dinner plates and they're like oh okay, there's a lot more to this. And I don't know whether it's a, a she'll be right sort of approach that Australians tend to take with managing most things or whether it's just that ignorance of, I thought the rest of the world operated like Australia. And we it, don't know what we don't know. Exactly, exactly. And, and that's where for us, information, education, that's why we do podcasts and webinars and all those things just to try and get the message out there because right. what, what does actually literally break our hearts is when we get phone calls from people and we do get this quite a fair bit where they've just agreed to sell their former principal place of residence that they bought back in yeah. 2000 in North yeah. Ride for 500000 It's now worth $3 million. And they've just been hit with the tax bill. And they're like, what can yeah. I do? And you can't put the genie back in the bottle. Yeah. Um, it can yeah. get yeah. worse than that too. Because if you reside in, say, like California, the double taxation agreement between the United States and Australia doesn't extend to state level. And California loves to sting people with a 20% tax. So oh, even though the IRS may not want money, California may want money. So 
it's what we call mm-hmm. two-dimensional device. You need to understand both moving parts when it comes to making those decisions. And sort of coming back to, you know, Chris's comment before about are people going down the route of what we call non-taxable assets, shares, ETS, and those sort of things that don't accrue a tax liability and then default to um, buying a property. Um, that is becoming more and more the case because there's a nervousness around what's Canberra going to do next, what's the state's going to do next. You know, yeah, when um, Anastasia Palaszczuk made that comment regarding land tax and stamp duty, uh, taking into account all the states, no one was talking about buying Queensland. It wasn't just a comment. It actually got passed. Yeah. And and then it was like uh, there was a hell of a lot of lobbying um, <laughs> that, that went on the REIQ, PIPA. Yep. Uh, a number of associations got in there and I think, you know, the Queensland government and then also it coincided actually with the PIPA in, in Investor Sentiment Survey uh, and the I think the Queensland government was forced to look at some hard data to realise that they were going down a very dangerous path in a in a in a yep. situation where we've got rental shortages. Um, interestingly enough, though, I mean, there's all that sort of stuff that goes on and you've got to be aware of it from where you are because – uh, you've got potentially clients wanting to buy back here or they're in, you know, talking to you and asking for advice. But what about when people are looking to invest elsewhere? They're looking to invest overseas. Um, do you find that, you know, you, we talked about Dubai, we talked about the dangers and the risks of that type of um, economy. But, you know, I know just from my own personal family experience, you know, the European story is a very it just property behaves very, very differently, and people behave around property very, very differently uh, across every country, really. But you know, there's there's the the myth about the uh, buying the one euro villa in some some little tiny country town, and people have done it, but it's been closed off. But it, it's problematic buying property in different jurisdictions because, of course, the laws are very different, and the risks are huge, and and people often have no idea what they're walking walking into. Do you come across people, people's, I mean, we talked about what your, your heartbreaks about what people do here, but have you heard some horror stories about what people have done buying property overseas and not realising what they're doing? And it's not more so people who live overseas buying property because they tend to be close to the situation and can manage it better. It's those who are buying property, property remotely. Um, and probably the one of the worst ones I've heard was uh, a client who drew out money, uh, refinanced their property, had a lot of equity built up in Australia, and a lot of expats do this. But we haven't seen a lot of Australian residents do this, where they draw money out and they use that to buy a property overseas, and then found out that the property never settled, and they never got legal title to that property. So that's probably the worst one I've ever heard. But certainly people looking at other property markets overseas as an expat, it's quite common now. So what we're doing is we're doing refinances yeah. on people's drawing equity out. When you look at places like Dubai, the deposit is 25%. And then the fees on top of that's another 7%. So to actually get into the Dubai property market is quite expensive. So you do need a, a quite a big sizable chunk of change yeah. to just get the money on the table to do that. And, and most people don't have that hanging around, but they might have bought a property in, in Melbourne for 600 is now worth 1.5. So they'll refinance yeah. that, draw that equity out, and then use that to get onto the Dubai property market. Then there's a bit of a hedge. Obviously, currency considerations, another one too. And we saw the Australian dollar get down to 60 ones against the US dollar. Um, great yep. when you're living in a place like this, when it's uh, we, we earn and live and spend on a, um, a US dollar derivative. Uh, now the Australian dollar is picking up again. The Australian market, even though it was appealing at 61, the higher the dollar gets, the less appealing it becomes again as well too. So yeah. then you might actually see people who are resident in Australia, if the dollar gets, say, to 75, you might find them now putting money overseas into euros or US dollars or whatever the currency might be to buy those properties. Um, I think yeah. we're also seeing, and coming back to the point about European properties, they're very almost like a, a hereditary sort of land. Yeah, you, know, you talk to, yeah, you know, we've got a lot of clients in France. And their properties don't tend to change much in value, but their mortgage structure, there's a very different. They've got fixed rates for 30 years. You know, probably the best one we had is yeah. a client in Germany who I'm actually talking to later today. The German bank, this is during the middle of COVID when the ECB was just trying to force cash out there. He locked in an 800,000 euro loan at 0.8% for 15 years. 
and he, and he gets on the phone oh. and he goes, what am I missing? And it's like, if you don't take it, I will. Yeah, that is just wow ridiculous. So those days are gone now, but you know, we're seeing a lot of folks in France who've got fixed rates of 2 and 3% on their properties for the next 30. So they're home and hosed. Brett, where are people? So you mentioned our Saudi. Um, you mentioned obviously Dubai. Um, I mean, the tech crisis, you know, is somewhat playing out. I mean, are people still moving over to Silicon Valley as much? I mean, yeah. you know, uh, where are people moving back to Aussie, you know, Australia from? I mean, Hong Kong had some pretty tough years there. I mean, the you know, so what, what's where? Like, where's the movement? You know, and, and are people moving? You know, from Hong Kong to Singapore or Singapore? Like, it's just it's, it's interesting, and I, I obviously I think that. We're not seeing very few expats coming back as much as we were. I would say that's yep. Yep. Um, why aren't a little bit. It's definitely really slowed down. Um, and but I mean, I, I do think that's a long term driver for the Australian property market. At some point, it's the money they're making. You know, ultimately does come back to Australia when the job opportunity when when the exchange rate lines up. And you know, there's a number of factors that come into their decision in kids schooling and things like that. So just give us a bit of a lay of the land on where you know people are moving and coming back from. It's been an interesting one where certainly with what Hong Kong went through, you know, the Yellow Umbrella Brigade and then COVID lockdown and Beijing's influence, a lot of folks out of Hong Kong went into Singapore. But now what's happening in Singapore, the cost of living in Singapore is ferocious. Yeah, if you were spending eight thousand Sing dollars a month on a on a on a place, it's now fifteen to twenty thousand Sing dollars a month to rent the same place. So what's actually been happening? along with Singapore government's been localizing a lot of jobs. So you have to go through a lot more steps to justify why you're hiring an expat as opposed to why you're not hiring a Singaporean local. Okay. So now what actually what we're seeing is a lot of those folks are actually coming out of Singapore into Dubai. And the right. reason behind that is Dubai has opened their doors. They've redesigned, they've taken the friction points of all these other countries and squashed them and flattened them out. So Truth. it's a lot easier. And so if you think about it, if you're a European or a British expat living in Singapore or Hong Kong, you can move to Dubai, do the same job, but you're closer to home. Now you're only an eight-hour flight away instead of 14 hours. From a Mars. Australian's point of view, you know, we quite often find there's sort of three paths that expats follow. There's either those who get overseas for one or two years, they've ticked that box, they've scratched that itch, they're coming home. Then on the other side, you have those who do sort of the two to ten and then, then you have what's called the lifers who are sort of here for overseas and the chance of them returning back to Australia, the longer they're overseas, reduces quite dramatically. So to me, there's a natural flow of, of, of people, but I don't see a lot of folks wanting to go back to Australia right now. And certainly in the Middle East, and I've been working right. in this region for the last 15 years, up until, say, five years ago, it was, I'm going to move to Dubai or Abu Dhabi or Saudi for two to three years, make bank, and then return to Australia. Now the conversation's changed dramatically, and they're saying, I'm coming overseas indefinitely. They don't know when they're going to return. And I'm not sure whether that was a function of COVID or, or what it was, but it's not just one or two people. It's the majority of people are now coming out for a greater period of time than one to two years. Now, we've been hearing quite a bit about increased uh, foreign investor activity in Australia, in yep. Australian property. Are you privy to any sort of intel on on what's happening there and where the where the dollars are coming from? I know they're n- they're not expats, but certainly, and I know on the on the mortgage side of things, Chris, you can probably talk to this. Uh, there's an encouragement now for non residents to be able to buy property here, um, which is sort of interesting. In the light of we've had rising properties in the face of rising interest rates, and also we've obviously got this rental shortage. That's Throw fuel on the fire. Any, any, yeah, any insight? Exactly. Any insights that you can give us on that, on what's happening with that overseas money coming into Australia? It'd primarily be migrants from a PR point of view. Those people seeking PR with the intention to become Australian citizens. Um, there's a lot of those folks here that we talk to quite regularly, and, and they're talking about if I buy property in Australia, will it help my application to get permanent residency? Um, from talking to the lady we work with um, on the immigration side, the answer is no. It used to be the case many years ago, but not the case now. But they're still doing it just to try and build up their chances of, of getting permanent residency back in Australia. And as we all know, what's it, 600,000 this year so far, migrants coming into Australia, and that's set to continue for, for future years. So to me, that's the people who are the ones paying money to property because they're not looking at it as from an investment premise point of view, you know, I think the people 
whether it's Australian citizens or not, the people who are buying property in Australia right now aren't doing it for financial reasons. They're doing it for emotional reasons. Even the expat, sorry, even the foreign nationals. Yeah. Yeah. And the reason being, you can get better yields and returns overseas. Yeah. And so when you say emotional reasons, it's really about having a home. Yeah. Having a home or or citizenship. Security, which is not, parking. Which is, oh, yeah, which is, okay. which is not, a, uh, not a, an Excel spreadsheet answer. Um, they no. want to <laughs> build a, a home base um, in that move back. So for me, I joke with clients all the time. I say, I can show you an Excel spreadsheet with all the answers that tell you X, Y, and Z. And you may take A, B, and C only because it makes you feel good. Um, and the amount of people we meet who buy property in Australia, not because it makes financial sense, but it makes emotional sense. They can overlook all the tax implications. They just need that place to call home at home. <laughs> yeah. Do you find that, um, I mean, I, it's if things that happen in Lebanon, right? Uh, I've got some friends that, you know, their family back there, the government basically took all their family's money, you know, millions of dollars just wiped out of the bank's accounts. Um, you know, is there that sort of fear and you know, obviously in China and things like passing wealth down generations is really difficult. And, you know, are you finding that just that safety of the Australian market is, is still such a big draw card for your clients that, you know, uh, but I mean, what, Dubai, does Dubai feel like a safe system for people to have their money? Is that, you know, up to the UK and the US might feel safe is, you know, how do people feel about spreading their money? Are they very safe in terms of what countries they're willing to go to? Look, I think from a regulatory point of view, they're okay with it. What they're more concerned about is um, their own personal ability to get the access to that money. Um, and there's also the estate planning considerations. You know, Sharia law is probably the bigger one here. You can have, and to try and encourage foreign ownership here, you can have a foreign will here registered um, in the DIFC courts, which is a free zone where we actually have our office. That means that the common law system, the Westminster system applies to your estate here. If sure. you, and, and that's, it's all these friction points that have always been a concern for people to bring money in the country and uh, now suddenly yeah. disappearing. So that has given people right. a lot more peace of mind as opposed to under Sharia law, the oldest male relative gets 60% of your estate. Um, unfortunately, the wife gets about 16%. Um, whereas if you have a local registered will under the DIFC rules, Wow, the okay. same would apply as if you're back in Australia, so which is pretty good. So they've done a lot of these sort of things to really give people that warm and fuzzies that, yes, it's okay to keep money here, whereas in the past, you keep no more than three to six months worth of cash, um, and then everything else you have overseas right. in, in foreign countries. But it is changing a lot, and you know, I think um, you know the team and I were joking about it last year when rental prices started to really increase in Dubai. In the past, your mortgage would have been uh, probably 70% of your rental payment. So it was actually cheaper right. to buy than it was to rent. When rents went yep. up, um, we saw an explosion of people buying property locally because suddenly your mortgage payment was 50% of your of your rental payment. Then interest rates started to rise up and because we, uh, the dirham is pegged the US dollar, whatever the US Fed does on interest rates, Dubai does to, to maintain that peg. So obviously as US Feds increase their mortgage rates, um, so to Dubai. So now it's starting to get to about eighty uh, percent based on that. But it, it's it, it's a game. It, it's people moving chess pieces around all the time. And, and yeah. when you live overseas, you have the luxury of choice. When you live in Dubai, you have all of these companies and countries marketing to you to buy in their country. You know, the latest one I saw right. yesterday was buying um, a chalet in Zermatt in, um, in in Switzerland. You know, you can buy legally in there and all those benefits and yeah, right. Every, everyone markets to you. So you almost, you sit here and go, where do I buy? Do I buy Australia or do I buy this? And you, you become a lot more prescriptive when it comes to your choices. Um, yeah. The amount of people I meet as clients who have property in foreign locations, it'd be 30 to 40% of our client base. You know, places like Austria, yeah, right. France, Germany, Italy, everywhere, because it's easy and it's only a six hour flight. I haven't heard of Airbnb. Everyone's doing Airbnb. <laughs> Everyone's <laughs> doing Airbnb. Yeah. yeah, in terms of being the landlord as opposed to being the tenant. So, um, and yeah. Airbnbs oh, right. yeah. here, yeah. like in Australia, have taken off dramatically. So they actually passed legislation yeah. to take away the, the murkiness of what was occurring here. Um, now it's a very structured process. And uh, like in Australia, you've got 
Airbnb management companies that people can turn over. And there was an interesting yeah. article oh, about two years ago where you could buy a a one bedroom apartment with in what we call downtown, which sort of surrounds Burj Khalifa, the big tall building. And based on the average uh, return night with a twenty percent vacancy rate, you can actually pay off that property within two years. That's assuming that no. it was rented eighty percent of the time. So yeah. I think people have seen those articles and gone, I need to get that. Yeah, and so but then that leads to obviously prices rising, and then that won't last long. Uh, but yeah, go, the market takes care of that sort of thing. Is it? Are you seeing that that's now changing? That there's less opportunity for people to make those gains? Slowing down. Yeah, you know, we've gone from forty yeah. percent growth in a calendar year down to twenty percent growth, and I think it's just going to keep slowing down. I don't think it'll get back to zero because there's too many people arriving. Yeah, you, know, you drive around Dubai, the place is full. Did you say 40% growth in a year yep. and you're down to 20? <laughs> Everything's relative. <laughs> Brett, you are- It's Mickey Mouse. <laughs> we, yeah. we spoke about it back in 21, I think. We'll have listened to the episode recently, but you know, I'm sure we would have. You know, the, the short-term uh, mindset in terms of the government, in terms of how they were like heavy-handed um, to say, like, here's a set day. If you don't sell your property, then you're going to have to pay capital gains tax on the, uh, the growth, that example you used before around ride. Um, but, you know, it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out, well, if you didn't sell it, then you're not going to sell it, right? Like, so when you look at Aussies overseas, I know you said they could move back into it um, and then they get the CGT to be waived if they make it your residence or a portion of it, et cetera. But the people who aren't moving back anytime soon, are they just holding these assets? Are they're they stuck. just because they're stuck? Yeah. So the intended... Uh, policy was to get expats to sell their properties in Australia so it would free up supply so Aussies could buy properties not Aussies overseas but what's actually happened is Aussies who didn't sell by that day have actually held their properties and won't ever plan to sell them the unintended consequence is actually worse so is that yep. your take on that policy and how short-sighted it was 100% I mean the joke of it was it was called the housing affordability bill to try and do exactly what you said increase increase supply decrease the uh, the cost of housing but because Canberra refused to listen to anyone uh, because they're the geniuses, of course, um, and they didn't extend that implementation period because we asked, just wait till COVID, let people come back. And yeah, because people, people couldn't sell. People couldn't yeah. get back to the country to to you know do what they had to do to, to sell the property. So yeah. that was yeah, stuck. Yeah. So what actually happened was now we've got people, and, and I met someone the other day who bought a house in, I think it was Manly, for $400,000 back in 1991. Place is worth four million bucks now, and I said, "What's your what's your agenda on the property?" He's like, "I'm going to just pass it to the kids and they can wear the tax liability." That's what that's where the mindset's gone. But also, too, <laughs> we've now got people who are finally realizing that some of their assets are um, underperforming from a return point of view. You know, the emotional side has dropped off. The financial side has definitely dropped off. And we met someone the other day who. They had a property up in Northern Rivers um, of New South Wales and uh, 10 acres, property was generating $86,000 in rental income, but the land tax was costing him $75,000. Fool. So yeah. they got all this capital tied up, an asset that is giving them pretty much zero return and a lot of headaches. Oh, yeah. That's, that's not a, a low maintenance investment property, that. No. I have to feel for these. I mean, you know, because... They, they bought a house, you know, and yeah, they went overseas, but, you know, now they've got a rental property in Australia and that's allowing someone to live in it, you know, assuming it's not vacant, right? Um, but, you know, they've been stung with a massive capital gains tax. Um, now they're going to be stung with ridiculous land tax. Like, and then that then means they've got to sell, right? And then, so they, are they actually, are they coming back to Australia just for the sake of the bloody tax, living in the property, like putting up all that lifestyle impact just to get around these rules? Like, I'm sure... Um, you know, some clients are having to go through a big emotional stress just to to avoid this tax. Is that what they're doing? Probably the best one in a very joking and tongue in cheek sort of way is as part of these new rules, the main rents exemption changes rules, we have these what's called life events where if within a six year period one of these life events occurs, you can actually be exempt from main residence or the tax that accrues from it. And one of them is divorce and a family court ordered divorce. I've actually had Husbands and wives sitting with me saying, So if we get divorced, we can avoid this tax. And I'm looking <laughs> going, You actually got to go through a court to get divorced to avoid paying tax. 
they go, yeah. And, and it never if ceases to amaze me. If the bill is big me. enough, why not? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and it never ceases to amaze me just how far Australians will go to avoid some tax. So people are actually genuinely considering you know, divorce. And it's not until I talk about the other complications that go with that, apart from avoiding a, a large tax bill on their former PPR, they go, oh, yeah, you're right. It's probably a bit bit much. Um, but yeah, look, it's it's people are, certainly people who have a work from home lifestyle, they can actually come in and out of the country. Mm, yeah. Over that sort of time frame. But under the new rules, where this gets very dicey is under the current rules, you're a non-resident for tax purposes on the day that you get on the plane as long as you meet the resides domicile 183 and common super test for a period of at least two years. Under the new rules, you are a non-resident from the day that you get on a plane as long as you have an employment contract for greater than two years. If you jump on oh, a plane wow. without a contract, you are technically a non as a tax resident of Australia for up to three years. So if you think, I'm going to make my money in Saudi, I'm going to go to the sand pit, you know, swing a few shovels and, and make bank. Um, but you don't have a contract, you'll be paying Australian tax on that income. So this sort of comes back to your point before, Veronica, about you don't know what you don't know. And uh, yeah, things are getting very murky. And just it's just that friction. Yeah. When, when, when a friction level increases on any decision-making matrix, it becomes too hard and, and we call yeah. it analysis paralysis. People go, uh, can't be bothered. And they just drop the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Brett, so good to chat to you. I think we were going to ask you a property done by but I think you've, just uh, hit Giving us with that. <laughs> yeah, the, the divorce. I mean, the straw that broke the camel's back. Maybe they'll... That was actually going to be my dumbo. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, maybe they were going to get divorced anyway. And that was uh, you know, a good excuse, the the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, thanks so much for coming on, Brett, all the way from Dubai. Um, hopefully the audio has been all right for our listeners. It has been a little bit patchy. Um, but um, yeah, thanks so much for coming on. And we'll look forward to chatting in a couple of years' time. Yeah, 2025, I think, is it uh, put in the calendar and we'll see what's happened then. And, uh, Let's do that. A lot can happen in those okay. uh, what's amount of time. Certainly can. Thank you. If you have a question that you'd like us to answer in an upcoming Q&A episode, you can send us a voicemail or written question via the website, theelephantintheroom.com.au, or you can email us directly at questions at theelephantintheroom.com.au. If you like what you're hearing, please share this episode with others you feel would benefit. And while you're at it, why not leave us an iTunes review? Five stars would be great. I know that sounds a bit cringy, but we have it on good authority that every review helps make it easier for other people to find out about us and hear what our amazing guests have to say.